Hello, and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, the last bastion of statistical truth against the waves of misapplied numbers, with slides. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be commanding the garrison today. With me, and complaining about the rations, is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I've decided to convert to a mystical religion. Haven't decided which one yet, though. Magic the Gathering. Ooh, sounds like fun. <laughs> Today's episode is about the working conditions of teaching academics. Joining me to complain about them is Yo, a friend of ours who spent more years than they care to recall in the grinding misery mill of sessional academia. How's it going, Yo? Hello, pretty good. So I mentioned in the p-hacking episode that teaching academics get their own sort of ruthless exploitation, which is distinct from what happens with research in the publishing industry. I think that the left overall should pay more attention to this for the few reasons. First off, academics are workers, despite the image that some have of us, and teaching academics are really at the forefront of casualizing of professional jobs among those workers. Let's have a look at what that means. These plots show the percentage and number of full-time equivalent casual teaching staff. The data comes from the Department of Education, released in December last year. They are based on the full-time equivalent number of people who are casually employed either as teaching only or as teaching and research within the cohort of staff who teach. So this includes casuals, this includes session, uh, sorry, people on short-term contracts and permanent staff. I am not including people who are research only in this data. For casuals who teach over this time period, over 95% of them were teaching only. Uh, this has dropped from 97% in 2011 as more teaching work has been casualized. For comparison of the non-casuals, which I'm going to, I am including the uh, contracts that last a few years in that, which is another sort of casualization, the percentage of those who teach who are teaching only as opposed to teaching and research was 7.7% in 2011 and is up to 15.9% in 2020. So these are very, very different populations. Yeah, I'm just looking at the graph and like looking at 2020 and remembering when like everybody lost <laughs> the jobs immediately, like extremely unceremoniously. It happened to so many people I knew it was like fucked, but like, yep. yeah, it was very dramatic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you can see like that precipitous drop there. So I don't get yelled at, I'm going to point out the fact that these y-axes don't go to zero. Neither of them go to zero. Do people usually yell at you for things like that? I'm covering my bases. There are some philosophies of data visualization which say that you should put your axes to zero if there is a zero. I think that that really depends on what you're trying to do with it. In this context, I do. I am interested in the relative change, and we're going to talk about what those numbers actually look like. I'm not using this to try and say that the change is bigger than it looks like. Look at the numbers. Like it, the axis is there for a reason. Also, come on, yo, we're releasing this to the internet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. I am going to get yelled at eventually by somebody when we have more than six viewers. <laughs> I wasn't aware it was like controversial. It's okay. I've learned something. <laughs> it's controversial sometimes. Like certainly. It depends on how you're using it. Like if you're, if I was showing this in a news broadcast, I would put the zero in because people are going to glance at it in a brief time period, may not look at the y-axis in great detail. So if they see a drop of this sort of magnitude, they may think that this is going from something close to 100% to something below 50%, which it right. isn't. But I could explain that in this context and I can't if it's like a 30 second clip or something. Yeah, anybody bothering to clip this show out of out of context is putting way more effort into it than they should. Um, I should probably make it, well, it's probably, I don't need to make it clear probably that of the many subjects I've ended up teaching, many of which I was not in any way qualified to teach, I will just, I'll point out, um, <laughs> no, none of those were um, statistics. So yeah. <laughs> that's fine. What we see, so we're going to look at the stuff pre-COVID and then talk about COVID a bit. So what we see in that pre-COVID period is an increase in the percentage of teaching done by casuals from about 26.5% in 2011 to um, a peak of just over 30%. So I think this was 30.9% in 2019. So what I mean by percentage of teaching is of the total hours on paper, and we will talk about that in just a second, that were done in teaching across universities in Australia, 30% of those were done by people employed on casual contracts in 2019. In raw numbers, you go from, this was 10,400 roughly, I think, like, I'm not going to go into tens or whatever in this, 
2011 to a peak of 14,500 in 2019. And this drops in 2019 to 12,400 400 in 2020. So this is the COVID drop. Uh, those, that's 2,100 full-time equivalent uh, positions that just disappeared in that one year. And like we don't have 2021 data out yet. That'll come out later this year. It hasn't improved a hell of a lot, I don't think. This is a direct result of COVID and is what happens to the casual staff who have no job security, as, uh, as I'm sure you have experienced and many people I know experienced as well. Yeah, for sure. How do they, how do they calculate the FTE of this though? Like as a question, I'm curious if you know the answer to like, I didn't get access to the raw numbers, unfortunately, to my immense frustration. They're just not published. I think it's considered a business secret at the university level. And this is the sort of data that they actually give to the government. My understanding of it, and I am happy to be corrected on this wrong, is that each teaching contract has written into it a certain number of hours that are done. This includes uh, like people who are on permanent contracts. They are written to have some proportion of their workload is teaching that accounts to some amount of hours of their supposed full-time or part-time work. For casuals, on a semester basis, you are just given a number of hours. So that means to have full-time equivalent, you kind of cobble together all those hours across, across different people in different contracts. So you add up to one full-time equivalent job in quotation marks, right? So if you have two people on casual contracts, each of whom are working half on paper, working half of full-time hours, they will add up to one full-time equivalent position. Yeah, I, it, I was just thinking of like, well, on paper is right, right? Oh because, yeah, oh, yeah. we'll get to that, <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things I did want to talk about as well is that of these like slightly over 2,000 full-time equivalent jobs that were lost, that does represent far more people than 2,100 because so many casual uh, jobs are only part-time or a few hours a week sort of thing on paper. Whereas like the, the full-time permanent positions are much more inclined to be full-time one-to-one equivalent. If I owned a business, I reckon I'd like to... Uh make the terms under which I employ people a business secret. I think that's pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty I mean, cushy position to be in. Yeah, it's particularly frustrating because um, universities are public institutions, but because they are treated, well, because they are forced to operate as businesses in competition with each other, there's all kinds of things that you can't find out about them because they're treated as business secrets. This includes the actual monetary breakdown of how things are spent within the university. I have tried to get access to this data. Uh, I went, like, at one of the universities I was uh, a student at, I actually went and explicitly asked a whole bunch of people in the administration, how do I get access to this? And the overwhelming answer was, you can't, sorry, that's not for you. Despite the fact that I was paying fees to that university. <laughs> And then later I was a staff member at that university. Yeah, one of the places that I taught at, um, I wasn't teaching there anymore um, when, when COVID hit, but they like still did all the, um, like the, I guess like, like vice chancellor and so on, like management tier bonuses at the same time as they were like yep. laying off all the casuals and sessionals. And I'm saying casuals and sessionals because I think, I don't know where this fits into this data but like acknowledging that quite a lot of people are on sessional contracts which aren't technically casual contracts but are still like a 12-week contract it yeah. just means you're not being paid casual loading yep um, but it's like it's yeah i think sessional and casual is usually the phrase i use to capture both of those but yeah so they fired every well basically fired they everybody. did not renew contracts how about that yeah they did not renew contracts and they also yeah but then at this particular institution which i will not name um they uh, yeah, they, they still did all these massive bonuses and I think they still did like a really major property purchase for the like chancellor to live in or something like that was mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. yeah, which they didn't release the details of, but I mean, you can kind of, you can figure out how much property is worth pretty easily. So, uh, and that too um, is a business secret yeah. incidentally, how much the, uh, I think how much the VCs get paid is published. I don't know if all the details of their bonuses are, but, uh, what they actually spent on that property may might not have been. The other thing to think about is that even though you saw these like full-time equivalent casual positions disappear, a lot of the time the subjects that those people were teaching didn't. 
So what actually happened with those teaching loads is they got dumped on the people who stayed and had permanent jobs. So if you were a full-time teaching academic, suddenly you had another subject or several more subjects on your plate, or you had more teaching to do within these because you had no money for casual teaching. And you didn't get paid extra to do that, of course, you just had to make it work. And this happened across huge numbers of universities that, like, all of a sudden, the already punishing workload of academics just got worse and worse and worse. Like, I know a number of universities which literally told their teaching staff, you have no casual budgets this year, at least initially, and uh, that nearly caused riots in some places. But what that basically meant is that if you had a, a subject where the lectures were done by the full-time staff member, but you had labs and tutorials and workshops or some combination of those which were handled by casual staff, if those casual staff don't have jobs anymore, somebody else has to teach that content. So the casualization is kind of compensating for the fact that there is so much work to be done and the full-time staff just don't exist to do it all properly. Yeah, and then they didn't have the budget to exploit their postgrads and other casual staff. Exactly. And uh, I think that the, 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 the full-time staff who are clued in to the working conditions of casuals, often because they were casuals for a long time, are very, very conscious of that kind of conflict of interest between full-time staff, particularly full-time staff who are more interested in research than teaching, and the exploitation of the casual workforce as well. There is some solidarity there, uh, but there needs to be more of it because more and more of, as we can see here, more and more of the industry is going that direction. I, I don't know. My experience kind of doesn't map onto that, unfortunately. Like, I think yeah. that, like, a lot of the, I, I know, or I've encountered a lot of permanently employed academics who are kind of, it, it's that, like, academic meritocracy approach, right? Mm, they believe yeah, that yeah. they're in their jobs yeah. because they deserve to be there. Um, and I mean, that's the lie you're told when you're doing a PhD, right? Like, <laughs> yes. If you work really, 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 really hard and also like do the shitty networking stuff, they make you do seminars about, I say this as someone who has not done a PhD, by the way, but um, <laughs> if you, you know, if you work really hard, you can look at the statistics of how many people get jobs after doing a PhD. It's not a pretty picture. Certainly not jobs in academia. No, well, absolutely not. And then, but you know, if, if you will somehow be the special exception and you're encouraged to believe that obviously because the university doesn't want you to drop out of your PhD because it's bad for their um, numbers. Yeah. It's bad for their numbers. Um, and then I think that it means that a lot of people who do get those jobs, they do believe that they're special and they think that everyone else should just go through what they went through. <laughs> like, Which is often it's... incredibly abusive. Yes. I have seen a couple of particularly bad lab groups, not none that I have personally been involved in, but I have seen them and heard from other people who've been involved in them, where basically PhD students become a source of publications and teaching uh, coverage for their supervisors and then wind up either not completing a PhD or not doing a PhD nearly as well and screwed for the rest of their careers as a result. Well, yeah, and I think I mentioned this in the p-hacking episode, but there does seem, in my experience meeting people around the place, there does seem to be a sense of sort of a temporary embarrassed tem tenure, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I think it depends on, it really depends on the fields. There are some fields which encourage that attitude a little more than others because they tend to have people who are, shall we say, less connected to material analysis of their conditions. So... Your engineering schools, for example, your physics departments, somewhat, more or less. Um, your business schools, I haven't had a lot of contact with, but I do see that in a lot of, like, humanities, so your history and your sociology in particular and your politics, there tends to be a little bit more awareness in those sorts of spaces about those material relationships. I mean, there's being aware and then there's doing anything about it. Oh, yeah, it. absolutely. Like, I, I mean, like, I, I came up entirely through the humanities and, like, through my degree in, in, in talking about watching television, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, you know, that's supposed to be a space in which people are entirely focused on, like, analysis of power relations and of, like, material structure. Like, at least that's the area I was in. It doesn't change the fact that then most of the permanent staff are your boss and that they act like they're your boss yeah. and that they yeah. resent they resent that their job is like I'm speaking about at this point ones who are like I guess older yes um but you know people who started in academia with the understanding that they would have a permanent job for like their entire life that would basically allow them to like 
you know, pursue their intellectual interests and go home whenever they wanted to and, like, (laughs) watch seven hours of Sopranos during the day in the office with three other annoying lecturers. Um, It's a real life example. (laughs) Um, You know, and then... Completely hypothetical, of course. And then as the conditions in academia across the board have obviously become worse, Mm. but, like, in some ways, you know, in, in some ways like obviously conditions that are just unacceptable, but in some cases conditions that are more like most people's jobs, i.e. Yeah. you kind of are expected to do some work and be sort of vaguely accountable to somebody rather than getting paid like, you know, in the six figures to, to not really do anything. Um, I, well, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of those people, are, one, they are essentially your employer as a, as a casual staff member, even though the university is the employer, but they are your boss. Um, and yeah, too, they resent, they resent their jobs getting harder and they, they, they genuinely benefit from the exploitate. Like there's, yeah, yeah they're yeah. protecting their class position when they're exploiting the labor of, of casuals and, and sessionals. So I don't know. I've got a pretty bleak outlook on that. <laughs> yeah, but no, really? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think comes into play with that transition is, as we talked about in, in the pay hacking episode, the explosion of publications. So the rate at which you are expected to publish has really ramped up in the past few decades as like as academia ballooned but also as the ability to computerize all these statistics around publication uh the comput the computerizing of the like publications themselves so stuff is available online that just used to be a paper copy and that has radically changed the experience of being one of those full-time uh researchers or even research and teaching academics in a way that I don't think they fully understand. And as you say, they resent it. Some of them are, are more clued in than others, of course, but there are plenty of them who who really do think that, well, what are students and casual staff for, if not to either supplant what I have to do in teaching or give me publications? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I should also be clear, like, I am aware that, like, PBRF and all of that stuff has obviously, like, created intense pressures on people and, like, yeah. lots of things are really unacceptable and so on and so forth. It's but, all kind of shit, frankly. Yeah, it is all kind of shit. But I think that, like, that's where, um, that's where, all, like, one of the reasons why, like, successful organizing around, like, casual um, teaching conditions in this country and also in New Zealand, like, have taken so long to get any kind of momentum yeah. oh yeah it's because it because academics who are unionized like uh permanent teaching and research academics um have like obviously have usually been a much larger membership of you know m- much larger proportion of the membership than casual staff because the union was offering nothing to casual staff um, yeah. and have actually like often actively blocked organizing efforts yep no i completely understand and like i i am a member of the union but i think that it is uh rather lackluster what is provided as support to casuals because like it's not it it, I, it should be in their interest to better support casuals but the establishment within the union doesn't see it that way but like if if you if the conditions were better for for like casuals and like including people who are research assistants and that then like also a lot of people would have to write their own research papers which would <laughs> yes. be a big, a, quite a big problem for some people i suspect yeah they wouldn't so easily be able to demand that their pa- that their name gets put on other papers i have yes, seen so. some truly astonishing publication rates out of some research groups like physically impossible it's obvious that they just demand that their name goes on every paper that comes out of the research group and they have a large research group cool yeah it's great so the second thing i wanted to talk about is that hours on paper idea in in teaching in casual teaching in particular we're an example of where measuring how much time people actually work as opposed to what's written down in a contract goes extremely awry workers in this area really wind up donating shitloads of time to their employers yo i suspect you have some opinions on this it's bad and widespread and like the backbone of of like the tertiary education sector yeah so can you tell me a bit about your experience of that yeah i mean that's a, that's a good summary of my entire experience of um casual and sessional teaching i don't know I, I don't really know where to start with it right because it's like it's just kind of accepted by so many people um mm. by so many casuals as like the reality of the work like everybody knows that you're getting you know, like, like, let's talk about marking, for example. Oh, yes. That's... Um, 
like, you know, you're getting often getting paid on some kind of formula, I think, yeah. in a lot of institutions. Yeah. Like, it will take you X time to mark X number of words, and perhaps some institutions have a more favourable version of that than others. Mm. Like, you know, I've worked somewhere where you were expected to be doing, like, five to 7,000 words an hour. Um, what even, like, what that even means um, is, like, you know... Who knows, right? Because it's so like variable depending on what kind of work it is and what kind of feedback you're supposed to be giving and so on and so forth. So I think generally for this kind of formula-based stuff, they say, okay, we have given the students a 4,000 word essay. So each 4,000 word essay should take you some fraction of an hour and then we multiply that out per student. Of course, the reality is it doesn't work like that. No, I think it, and it obviously falls down on lots of levels. Like to start with, the the word count per hour thing is always just kind of arbitrary. And like yep. that figure is definitely one of the worst ones I've experienced. And also like the, in that particular setting, that that was a bad formula. Also the hourly rate was much lower than a lot of other institutions. Mm. Um, so it was, you know, it was just kind of bad on all sides. But yeah, there's the fact that often it takes longer to actually read the assignments than even the time that's allotted to grade them. Yes. Um, it, so it doesn't include the actual time it takes to read and grade. Um, the level of feedback you're expected to give and the style of feedback is often based entirely on the whims of the like unit coordinator or the lecturer yeah. or whoever yeah. that you're working under if you're, you know, if you're not the lecturer yourself um, or, you know, whoever happens to be able to make those decisions in the department or whatever at any given time. Um, but like, you know, I've taught on multiple subjects at the same time where there would be extremely different expectations mm. and you don't really have any ability to question those because you're the um, casual you person. Another, and then you, yeah, yeah. You, exactly. You might not get another contract if you make too much of a fuss. Um, it also doesn't include like literally any of the other kind of admin, like the time it takes to email back and forward with the other, you know, the other teaching staff yeah. or whoever, um, the time it takes to upload the grades, the time mm. it takes to like, you know, like if you, any kind of stuff that if you were working in a way where you physically went into an office and like clocked in and you would do your work and, you know, if your work includes needing to like get up to walk over to the other side of the room to get something, you know, you know what I mean? That's like, included. None yeah. of, none of, none of that's included. No breaks are included. I don't think mm. ever in these formulas. If you nope. took breaks, then I don't know how it would work usually you're not really being given anywhere to do this work as well right this Mm. is like even pre-covid obviously that's you know like um everyone's working from home now except the people who get dragged back into their offices because the head of school decides that it's time yeah exactly but like even with marking like before covid i think most people would have been doing most marking like at home or like late into the night in like an office if there was one um that you were given access to um so I mean, and also you're often using your own, like you're using your own computer and all of that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I have, I don't think I've ever been offered a computer by university for a teaching job. Oh, of course not. I feel like it's special when they like give you an email login before the class, like the first (laughs) week of class starts um, or like agree to let you have library access between, between semesters. Like God forbid you would like download, you know, download an article that's relevant to your teaching um, <laughs> on university resources in the in the mid trimester break. Oh, and of course, the thing where you don't get paid in the mid semester break—that's a yep. fun one. Yeah, yeah, you're only ever paid for the actual. Basically, it's accounted for fast face to face hours. But like, if we were looking at things other than marking, I think obviously formulas for like teaching prep time. Like, often people will oh, look we'll at the hourly rate. <laughs> yeah, like people will look right at the hourly rate for teaching, um, for the actual teaching hours, and think that looks really good. But like, mm. of course, it doesn't actually break down and do anything good. Um, yep. And then also, just I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but just the immense level of like pastoral care that students Mm. require and that the university doesn't provide in any other way really so it's provided usually by not just sessional and casual staff but i think in particular like tutors particularly casual tutors if they're good yes uh there are a lot of tutors who let's say do not perform that role because they uh don't feel it is their role not unjustifiably but also or they are just not capable of it well, yeah, and I mean, that's often kind of shit, but I mean, at the same time, I often wish that I'd been one of those people, to be honest. Because, <laughs> no, no, like, I get it. It would be nice to be less exploited. 
Yeah, but I mean, and that's the thing, right, is that ultimately this all becomes an experience of like self-exploitation, which I think is a stupid term that doesn't mean anything because I don't think you can really exploit yourself. But um, like well, it, most, it is, yeah. I would call it instead um, begrudgingly buying into the exploitation that is foisted upon you, which is not quite so snappy, of course. There is a certain level of stuff that has to be done for the subjects to run, for the people to function within those subjects as students. A lot of people teaching are doing it because they genuinely care about teaching and they care yeah. about students. So, of course, you're going to do those things. Like, of course, if somebody needs support, you're going to provide it. Yes. Um, like, sometimes there's a pressure to do that that's named, but often that pressure isn't actually named. So, it's not even recognized as part of your job. But we all understand it as part of our jobs, right? So Yeah, I mean, all of us have been students and we have or have not had that support available to us and it, and you feel it. Like yeah, I, I like, have needed a shitload of support over the course of my many degrees. And when it's not there, you you do fall foot through the cracks. And I have seen it happen to people that I know. And even as a student, you try to provide like that kind of institutional knowledge to the people you know when they are not supported by their teachers. For sure. And I mean, I think that's the other part of it is is often that like as a as a like session, sessional or casual staff member in that situation often as well as support you're actually you're providing advocacy you're actually advocating for the student either openly or covertly um like it's yeah and i think those are the people who end up staying in the work for a really really long time um, i mean it is in in many respects that aspect of it is just as to be able to provide that help is quite fulfilling but in the same way that like other forms of care work are exploited because the excuse is, is, oh, well, you get to feel good while you're doing it, and that should compensate for the fact that you can't afford rent. It's exactly the same in teaching. As an exercise, uh, I actually sat down and estimated what I'm doing for a stat subject that I run compared to what I'm being paid for. So let's walk through that unhappy calculation. Oh, yeah. Each week, I have the following like face-to-face stuff. So I have a two-hour lecture and a two-hour tutorial. So these are the kind of face-to-face teaching. Each hour of lecture is actually paid for four hours. So one hour of lecture is like the hour to give the lecture and three hours to prep it. Yeah, so that's four hours for the lecture each, uh, sorry, four hours times two. So I get eight hours for the lecture each week. You know, tragically, I was about to say, oh, that's quite generous. (laughs) <laughs> it feels that way when you see it like that right i mean it's obviously not but i'm just like just yeah compared to some other institutions perhaps yeah in addition for the uh each one hour of tutorial uh the cats arrived you get the one one hour runtime if it's running for the first time you get one hour prep and overall one hour which is like admin and that sort of thing. Uh, it's usually called adjacent marking. And is this in a context where you're also like the, whatever the appropriate title is at your institution, but like the convener or coordinator of the whole unit? Yes, uh, that is paid on top separately. So this setup here is based on the first time where a tutorial runs, regardless of whether or not you're running the um, subject. If you're running the subject, you get an extra amount on top per hour for these. The second time or any subsequent time the same tutorial runs, you do not get the hour of prep time. So if I have two tutorials for the same subject, the first one is paid at the equivalent of three hours per hour. The second one is paid at the equivalent of two hours per hour. Uh, I only have one tutorial for this particular subject, so I'm I'm not um, a subject to that. And this time, I was last time I taught it. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that was particularly stupid as a formula for tutorials. Like, I kind of understand it for repeat lectures because you are, like, just, like, if someone's doing yeah. a lecture and it's a repeat, it is, like, you know, it's a lecture. But with tutorials, it's like, well, it's different depending on the group of students. And, like, anyway. It depends on what you're trying to do. Like, some of that I think is true, but I think the same would account for repeat lectures as well. I guess, I guess it depends on how big your class is. But... Lectures do not run the same if you teach them to different groups of students. You'll get slightly different questions, some the same, but you've got to account for some of that. The The prep time, we'll come to this, but it also really depends on whether or not you have been handed the tutorial or whether or not you have to write it yourself. And uh, that varies wildly across subjects. 
in my case, for this subject, I've been writing it all. <laughs> yeah, and also, yeah. like, if you've been handed what you're supposed to do, like, is it is it actually usable or is it complete shit and you have to change it, but also, yep. like, somehow yep. pretend that you're not changing it so that you don't offend the delicate ego of the person that's written it. <laughs> Thankfully, I have not experienced that, but I have seen it, for sure. Yeah, no, I have experienced that many times. It's a, yeah. it's, uh, it's a fun one. I mean, like, this is – so much of my experience of casual and sessional teaching is, like, just the – yeah, the – um negotiation of um the ego of whoever's running it yeah and having to do a lot of stuff extremely extremely covertly um and having to make people feel that you are doing i guess it's like yeah trying to say no to things as much as you can while um (laughs) while still creating an atmosphere of yes from the perspective of the person who's hearing it which is exactly the same skill set that i got from sex work by the way so it's very convenient (laughs) um but yeah, I just want to interject on one thing that we haven't talked about to maybe just have floating in the background here, which is also class sizes. Yes. yes. Because when I was an undergrad, um, which is always a worrying stat to us, um, <laughs> which was quite a long time ago. It's like, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Mm. I don't know. Um, like, you know, it was not uncommon to be in tutorials where like it was considered a, a bit of a large tutorial if there were more than like 12 students. Like, that mm. was quite big. Whereas, um, like, across the, um, like, both kind of traditional traditional university sector and also the sort of weird private tertiary sector that I've taught in as well, it's, like, I've had classes, like, tu- tutorials, not lectures, not seminars, like, tutorials, um, where there are, like, like, up to, like, between 35 and 40 students. Far out. That's not a tutorial anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. and then also... I. It's the other thing I wanted to throw in is we're talking about teaching and we're calling it teaching, which is correct because that's what it is. But a lot of the time when people talk about tutoring specifically, there is this idea that as a tutor, you're not actually teaching. Like you're just facilitating Mm. discussion as if (laughs) just facilitating discussion is some kind of like. Lesser thing anyway. Well, yeah, as if that's somehow like less effort or more lowly or like as if that isn't part of good teaching practice anyway. But yeah. um, Yeah. I think that's the that's the other kind of fantasy because I think so much of I don't know I don't feel as confident making this claim about Australia but certainly in New Zealand um, and I imagine it's probably the same here um, generally but like I think a lot of the um, ideology that's kind of driven a lot of this or at least the like myth that's told to everybody is that um, you know that like tutoring I'm, and I'm talking about tutoring rather than lecturing um, specifically like that tutoring is something that you kind of just do to sort of top up your scholarship or something like it's not actually anybody's income it's not their main thing they're surviving on like I think everyone knows that's not the case now but I think that's still that weird underlying idea it's kind of like how people you know like how uber says that nobody you know nobody's like actually an employee, a way to make some yeah. extra cash and it's not actually anybody's main income it's just like a top up and it's fun and flexible or something yeah um, so that that varies hugely across countries and it varies a lot across subjects as well. So, um, and it fields. So what you need to teach, what you need as background knowledge to teach something is hugely variable, I think. And like for a lot of, um, grad, grad students. So your PhD students, master students, even honor students. Cause I, I was uh, teaching tutorials as an honor student as well. Um, it, is a way to top up your scholarship because the scholarship is below minimum wage if you actually do the hours like full-time research and also um it's it's basically a a relatively for most of the people in these in these like in these jobs it is a smaller portion of the time so if you are doing your full-time research or honors or whatever you're not going to theoretically anyway not going to be spending 40 hours a week doing teaching and most supervisors that I have research supervisors that I have encountered are willing to back their student up and not having to do 40 hours a week for working in Australia. The U S is an entirely different environment because almost all of their casual teaching is done by grad students. They are not paid on top of their scholarships to do it. It is just an expected part of that scholarship that you will do some amount of teaching. 
and you get really, really screwed over there. Like with it, casualization in Australia is bad. Casualization in New Zealand is bad. In the US, it is 10 times worse as things tend to be, right? For the people for whom this is most of their income, they tend to be the sessional staff rather than the casual staff or on the short-term contracts, if they can get them anyway. That is an increasing amount of the subject coordinators. So what you typically get with a split there, and that I this is anecdotal in the sense that I have not seen the firm numbers to back this up, it's just what I know from being in the industry and being exposed to this, most of your casual lecturing positions are not grad students. These are the people who have graduated. They either have PhDs or some sort of, typically some sort of higher degree. They are running the subjects and doing the lecturing. Your tutors, your lab demonstrators, these are either postgrads or honors. So there is that split and casual lecturing up here gets a better rate. And as I said, uh, being the subject coordinator gets you a better tutorial rate as well in general. There are some universities where the split is between do you have a PhD already or do you don't. So if you have a PhD, you get better pay rates. If you don't have a PhD, you get a lower pay. So there yeah. is that kind of divide there. And generally, the, if you have to hire somebody to be a casual, they're more likely to do the tutorials. Yeah. Um, I think also the other thing to be thinking about is how many people are working for multiple institutions at the same time when they're doing this as well. Yep. Because you might be doing it not as a postgraduate student. Like you yeah. might be a postgraduate student. Well, in that's the situation I'm in, actually. So I teach, I'm running this subject at the university where I'm not a student. But like for me, my highest qualification is an honours degree. I, I moved uh, to Australia to do a master's degree and then I just never did it. Um, mm. And I don't really have any intention of doing that now. No, that's um, fair. But yeah, but like I guess that kind of it was interesting as I still continued in sessional teaching because particularly by the end at a point where I was doing like um, unit coordination and um, lecturing and stuff, which I just kind of fell into, you know how it is, like you get one contract I, and then you get another contract and so well, on Well, so I am forth. coordinating this subject and my highest degree is honours as well. Yeah, well, exactly. But like what I also experienced was like being viewed like – yeah, I don't know. This is almost like a whole other conversation, but like the kind of like um, in, internal, like weird internal classism. Um, well, for between people who have PhDs and people who don't. Yeah, yeah. but people Absolutely. who are all still having the same, like everybody's still a shittily, like shittily employed casual, casual or sessional staff member. Like, yeah. Um, but because I was doing this at a non-prestigious institution, I have an honours degree and I was talking to people um, like attempting to organize with, you know, like yeah. going to union meetings with people who were at like, you know. Um, Group of eight. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, exactly. So for, your... for people who aren't in the know, if you will, Group of Eight is like basically the eight most prestigious universities in Australia. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm talking, I mean, I didn't teach at any of these, so I don't mind saying I'm talking about people at like Melbourne Uni and like yeah, yeah. Monash and those kinds of institutions who were... To be fair, we're being paid better than I was, um, but we're still like on shitty short term contracts and being treated like shit, yeah. but would like kind of, yeah, immediately kind of um, look down on you for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty really, embarrassing. It's really I think this is what Bart was talking before almost, um, which I'm going to hand the microphone to Bart. <laughs> Doing a PhD is so stupid, man. It's not what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't actually what I thought you were going to say, but it's, but I, but I think it's true. Well, it's, no, I um, certainly get it. I mean, I, I am doing one because I want to and because I have the support that enables me to do it in a way that's not punishing. Yeah, not it's... not all PhD students, et cetera. But, um... Yeah, yeah. Like, I've certainly seen a lot of people who just have such a shit time of it and don't get the work out of it they thought they were going to work. Well, yeah. and a lot of people I, – I, I've seen stats on this in New Zealand. I don't remember them right now, but so many people don't finish PhD, PhDs. Yeah, it's... Like, PhD completion rates are so, so, so low. But actually, but what I was thinking of was what you were saying before about, like – temporarily embarrassed permanent academic is actually <laughs> what I was meaning. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> no, no, it's also, both of those are true. And I have certainly seen of the people who spend like the rest of their lives, basically casual teaching who don't have PhDs, they are typically very, very good teachers, but they are still looked down upon. They still don't get job opportunities that they are perfectly good to do in terms of their skill set. Because there is that class divide between PhD and people who don't have PhD. 
So I'm going to uh, wrangle us back to this particular computation just so we can get through it. <laughs> but one of the things I am going to say is that uh, I mentioned tutorial versus lab versus lecture earlier and workshop. So in a lot of institutions, there is a division between these three different forms of teaching. So as um, Yo has said, the there is a split between tutorial and lecture. Uh, this is because lecture is like the delivery of content. Tutorial is usually you are there to facilitate discussion, help students work through problems, that sort of thing. But there is a further division between tutorial and lab is the typical one, where lab is you are in a laboratory, you're doing your chemistry, your bio, whatever, you're working with stuff. Lab demonstrating is typically not paid the same as tutorial, it's typically paid less. So where I have seen it done, tutorial has this um, three to one in the first one and two to one after that. Lab demonstrating is one to one or two to one at most. The equivalent in some other disciplines would be like running, like running film screenings and things like mm. that, which I guess arguably is probably less work than running a lab, but all the same. Like, yeah. Well, so actually there is sometimes still people this... just don't get paid for those at all, actually. Oh. But. <laughs> Great. But like with, with lab work, there may be prep time that you need to do. You may need to review the experiments you're working with, look at the data set, look at the equipment, make sure all the equipment is in place for you to do the lab, even if your lab tech is meant to be doing that. And the division between the professional staff, your lab techs, your admin support, that sort of thing, and the academic staff is a whole other discussion to have another time. I don't have this because I am just doing the tutorials, I'm not doing labs, but in a lot of your science subjects where you do have labs, as well as tutors, as well as everything else, your lab demonstrators are typically not paid the same rate as the tutors are. Even though I think they should at least get hazard pay because the rate of accidents, physical health and safety accidents that happen in labs is sky high. I may have seen somebody get hit by a flying, an accidental flying texter or a like whiteboard marker or something, but I have never had to deal with somebody who's put a pet through their hand because they've been doing something wrong in a lab or set something on fire and whatever else. Um, I feel compelled to mention that I've actually thrown pens and whiteboard like, uh, erasers at students' heads many times. What I meant was I used to gesture too enthusiastically and would accidentally <laughs> punch objects at students. Yeah, I'm giving maybe more background to why I don't teach anymore. <laughs> um, no, not really. With this stuff each week, let's put, put some more numbers down in terms of what I'm paid. So I get 12 times 8 hours for lectures. I get 12, because there's 12 weeks, times 6 hours for tutes. So that is 96 hours for lectures, 72 hours for tutes. I am paid an additional 18 hours for admin coordination. These are basically I -O -N, uh, additional hours I get for the fact that I am running the subject. I managed to wrestle, uh, I think it was 20 hours for rewriting my subject. And I had- The last place, the last place I taught, they didn't pay you for doing that. Oh, this is, um, this is one advantage of being one of the very, very rare stats teaching people, is that I can say, I want this time to rewrite the subject because it needs to be done. I have a, um, like, basically my boss, the person who runs the um, math subjects at this particular uni, is very, very supportive of me doing this as well, so that really matters if you don't have other people above you as a casual or sessional staff member, well, you don't yeah. get that support either. And, and someone who's prepared to advocate for their, yeah, for yeah, their yes. professionals and casuals. And I also have marking time. So I have oh, 16 students in this subject, so I am paid for 16 hours. And that's a total of 222 hours over the semester. Now, when I first looked at that number, I that's, made a guess. That's 16 hours per semester for marking? Yeah, so it's one hour per person. Yep. I, I mean, I know that and I know you know that, but I feel like that's something a lot of people don't know. And I feel like it's such an outrageous way of deciding um, how long yeah. it will take to do marking. Like, <laughs> you have one hour. Like, I've said that to students before because I'm, I was really into being transparent with students about their work conditions mm. um, in the hopes of like radicalizing them further. Yes. Um, but I think that's part of a different, yeah, that's part of another conversation um, about like um, students being like, yeah, understanding themselves as like consumers of the product that you are providing. Is educate um, yeah, yeah. I hate I 
oh, we're going to get to this, but I hate but yeah, that like, is how it's it is really, structured. It's really brutal to have to say to a student, this institution pays me one hour to mark your work this term. Yes. Like, they just look at you like, oh, that's, yeah. Yep. And, like, I, so I did an arts degree first, and I, I had an, a rough idea at the time of what marking actually involved. But, I mean, you you know, as a, as a student writing that sort of stuff, you know how long it takes to write and read essays because you do it. I mean, I hope. And you, to, the idea that to read the three or four essays you produce over the semester and mark them and give feedback would take an hour, you know that's ridiculous. So I do certainly think that students can be made aware of this sort of thing. Okay, so that's what I am paid for. Let's estimate what I'm actually doing because I looked at this number, I thought, oh yeah, that probably represents maybe 75 to 80% of what I actually do. That sounds about right. <laughs> it's not. It's not even close to that, really. So let's go through that estimation process. So first we're going to look at the lectures. So I am recording and editing lecture videos this time around because there's still a pandemic on and I'm immune compromised. Each week I do six to 12 short videos and they take about four hours to write. So that is scripts, slides, or like proofs and whatever else, depending on the topic. They take about 2.5 hours. This is probably an underestimate to record. And I'm going to conservatively say 3.5 hours to edit because I do actually edit my videos. So already we're over the eight hours because this comes out to be 10 hours per lecture. The eight hours was based on the assumption that lectures would be done live. Of course, this didn't change when we all went online because why would the university pay more for production value? If you've ever wondered why recorded lectures sound and look like shit, this is why. We aren't given equipment, tools, or pay to make them better. The only reason that my lectures look semi-decent is because I invested my own money in a Wacom tablet and a good microphone to record stuff like this. Uh, I also have, you know, a desktop computer which can render the videos in a reasonable time. A lot of people are doing things like recording Zoom sessions, which have very bad video, very bad audio, and their microphones are crap and it sounds awful to try and deal with and to try and learn from those videos because they're just not well recorded. As mentioned, I couldn't even get a laptop out of the uni I'm working for to do this. I had to do this all on my own money. So this gives me uh, 11 times 10 hours, uh, which is 110 hours. Now the reason it's 11 is because one of the weeks is the mid-semester exam. So that's my lectures. Now the tutorials. So this is two hours face-to-face. But I have been writing them, which takes about two hours to write. So that is the tutorial sheet and solutions and any extra material for relevant stuff. So one of the things I talk to my students about is COVID testing or the flood risk statistics. There is a significant crossover, and I'm going to use that word intentionally, between the content of this podcast and the content that I talk to my students about. Because if they don't understand something, then chances are the general audience isn't going to understand it either. There, like, also stuff like answering emails, additional vision for assessments, logistics is easily another couple of hours a week. So let's say that's another one hour per week. This gives us seven hours. Some of these tutorials I wrote last time I taught the subject, but because I wasn't paid properly for them then, I'm putting them in this because I did a lot of work that semester that I wasn't paid for. I also have, on top of this, uh, one to three hours per week of consultation. Is that like, is in like an office hour for students or? Yeah, except it's online. So it's a Zoom room office hour. And uh, even if I don't actually have any students show up to these, they still run. So that's probably about 25 hours over the semester, which theoretically also comes out of the time allocated to the tutorials, but doesn't actually. And then we have assessment. I write the assignments and exams for this subject. I don't necessarily have to rewrite all of them every year, but it takes time to do. So it probably took me about 12 hours to write the problem sheet, marking guide, and solution to each of the three assignments. So that's uh, 36 hours. And the mid-semester was split with another academic who's using my material, so that's an additional five. The final exam can be mostly reused from last year and will take about another five hours to set up. Please excuse my incredibly shitty working. I'll write all this out in full in the next slide, but that's another 42. And then we have the marking. Now, because I have been able to set up the assessment and because maths and stats are 
fields at the undergrad level where it is appropriate and you can do this, it probably only does take me about one hour per student to mark the assignments. Uh, this is precisely because I have a marking guide and solutions that I have written that allow me to just basically go through and say, this is correct, this is correct, this doesn't have everything, so it's going to get a couple of marks off, that sort of thing. Very radically different to marking um, essays. Also radically different to marking some areas of maths and stats where you have proofs. So a proof in maths and stats is a argument. It is saying from these assumptions we can get to this conclusion. Ideally it is logically constructed, clear, well written, all the rest of it. In practicality students don't know how to write proofs very well, they are very hard to mark. The amount of information that is condensed into a page of proof is just phenomenal and I would say in terms of how long it takes to read, a um, a one-page proof probably takes me about as long to read as a 2,000-word essay. At this level of stats, I don't need to do that, but certainly in like second or third year or honours subjects, you would need to do that stuff and the marking balloon. I, I think it's worth flagging here as well, like with essays, it takes a lot longer to mark a poorly written essay. Oh it God, does. doesn't it just? Um, which isn't to say that a quote unquote well-written essay is necessarily work that has like, you know, more interesting thinking or like that the, you know, less well-written essay doesn't have a lot of interesting things going on in it. But like an essay that someone hasn't really had a time to like edit or has, you know, they've clearly like written it, you know, like Morning in the three hours yep. before the <laughs> deadline, which like, you know, I mean, obviously that's part of, that's been part of like student life experience, you know, for Time immemorial, let's say. Yeah, well, exactly. For as long as there have been students. Um, but but at the same time, I guess also, like, I'm sure it's probably the same for you, Tess, but, like, the number of students that I had who, like, were working 40 hours a week. Yeah. Um, that was particularly true in my last job because I was doing, like, blended – it was, like, blended uh, medium. So it was, like, online and, uh, and in person. And a lot of the students were, like – a lot of the online students would be um, – uh you know like often parents or and or working you know full working time all day yeah. during the day or there'd be people who were studying during the day and working nights like yeah um, yeah it's it's because so, you, you just don't have the support now to be a student that used to exist no small yeah. part because the student cohort has radically changed and you have a lot of people now who would not have been students a hundred or so years ago when it was basically the um it was the realm of the middle, uh, the upper middle class, such as the middle class existed, and the very much the upper class. So you would go to university and your parents would pay for you or whatever else. Or even in like the 50s and 60s, the government would just pay you to be a student. Radical. Yeah, the Imagine... university was free like yeah. in New Zealand until I don't remember when. But um... I do distinctly remember, um, this is like secondhand, I spoke to the person who... Um, was reviewing this person's application to do a subject again. So this student had failed a subject twice. Uh, they had to, I think, twice or three times. They had to apply to do it a third time, a third or fourth time, because like the the university just won't keep letting you fail a subject. And so they basically asked, "So what is going to be different this time around?" And the student said, "I have quit three of my five jobs." And like, dear God, <laughs> I mean, technically, <laughs> I have. Uh, let's call it two jobs. Uh, I teach more than one subject, but it's with the same institution. So we'll call that one job. And then my research, so that's two jobs, right? Five jobs and full-time student is insane. Oh, it's so grim. And like, you know, this comes back into the whole thing of like, what are you doing in a tutorial? Like leaving aside yeah. the fact that obviously it's teaching and like, it's, you know, this idea that it's somehow something lesser than teaching or less work than teaching or something is stupid anyway. But often in tutorials students often aren't going to lectures so actually in a tutorial yeah. you're often having to rapidly re-deliver lecture content to students yeah. um and i mean and then the idea that like if it's a subject where there is reading that has to be done in between <laughs> the like the idea that students will have done that is just like laughable. i think it's just laughable in most yeah in most situations these days like i'm sure there are people who are doing that and I, I was one of the nerds who did the reading but i was also one of the nerds who had my parents pay for my education so. Well, I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I was a nerd, and I liked the subjects I was doing. This is the only time I'll ever describe myself as a nerd publicly. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay, we know. Um, yeah, but you're voluntarily <laughs> appearing on a stats podcast. I'm sorry, but you're tarred with the same brush as us. 
Yeah, well, anyway, um, <laughs> tainted forever. Um, but, I mean, you know, like I often didn't manage to do the reading for lots yeah. of reasons. Yeah. Um, some of it was part-time, for me, part-time, not full-time work, but like some of it was part-time work. Some of it was like, you know, like lots of students often are dealing with like mental health stuff or disability stuff, both was true yep. for me. Like, um, I don't know, it's like, yeah. So, so I guess my point is that just the conditions are bad for everybody. Like the conditions yes. are bad, are bad all over. Um, and it then affects the work conditions that you have, which also affects what you're actually able to give back to students, which, you know, it's just like this horrible feedback yeah. loop for which the university and capitalism is ultimately to blame. But well, one of the things that the universe that, sorry, the union does get right. I just wish that they would expand who this applied to is that like, Staff working conditions are student learning conditions. So all of this stuff, how we are underpaid, how we are not supported to put all the hours in that it actually takes, means that you get shit subjects. Because the people who would otherwise give their all to make the subjects good aren't supported to do that. It sucks. And this is why I think a lot of people quite justifiably see that university education isn't worth it because they don't feel like they learn anything. But anyway, I'm going to keep going with this calculation because I promise we're going to get through it. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to incorporate into this is that I wrote a complete set of lecture notes for this subject. Uh, this basically functions as a textbook, except that I'm not publishing it formally. It's just a PDF that they can download. One day I'll get a printed copy for myself because I like, I like having printed books. I wrote half of this last time I did the subject, but I had to write the first half this time, which was about 50 hours of work over the summer uh, to write. And an additional, let's say, 10 hours to edit the uh, notes over the course of the semester. So that's another uh, 60 hours. And because I'm not publishing this, I don't get any kind of publication royalties or whatever else. Not that I would actually charge my students, because that would feel icky. They're already paying enough in fees. So all up, what do we have? We have 110 hours for lectures, 84 for the tutorials and admin, uh, 42 was assessment, 16 for marking, 25 for consultation, and I'll, I'll say the pastoral care comes into that. And 60 hours was notes, which gives us 337 hours, of which I am paid 222. So if I just say this is an amount of money that I am being paid, uh, then I get paid for 65% of the hours that I actually do. So this is 222 on 337 times 100 to give us a percentage. That should be equals to, not, yeah, go in there. Equals to. And I am effectively donating about 110 hours to university, but I can work out based on my average rate of pay for all of this stuff, what my hourly rate is. So lectures and tutorials and assess and marking are not paid the same rate. On average, I reckon I get about $50 an hour for that 222 hours. So for the work I'm actually paid, if I multiply $50 by that 65%, which becomes 0 0.65 as a proportion, what I get out is about $32.50. So that is my actual hourly rate, approximately for the work that I'm doing to cover this subject. That's not bad money. Uh, it's certainly the envy of the people who I know who are working in aged care, for example. Well, I was just going to say, just as a as a comparison, at the institution I most recently worked at, which is now going back a couple of years, um, and it was the last one I worked at before I was like just never again. But I was there for several years. That kind of ba that fi that fifty dollars for me would have been uh, thirty one dollars and sixty five cents. Yep. So um, you can so imagine, so if we do that calculation here, so 31.65 times 0 .0. 0 0.65, and then I f didn't have a calculator, so let's pull up a calculator. All right, uh, 31.65 times 0 0.65. So you're getting paid below minimum wage. Yeah, and I would say that for me at that time, probably it would have been more like I was getting paid for about 50% of the hours that I did on a, yep. on a good on a good month. Yeah, because so of the, all the it, marking, I imagine. That so it becomes up. it becomes much a much grimmer story, actually. So Yeah, um, so I have yeah. comparatively good conditions within this like sector of the workforce. I reckon that this, even, even what I get, this 32.50 per hour, is way lower than what people think academics make. 
It's also about a quarter of what I could be making with my qualifications in private industry, which is why academic work just hemorrhages people. And I, I suspect that's quite intentional on the government's behalf, because why would you pay academics to do good teaching to provide you with a workforce who is well educated when they start making trouble for that? So within my subject, a lot of this time will make my job easier in the future, so long as I get employed to teach this subject again. As I have mentioned, I have pretty good job security because statisticians who can teach well and haven't been snapped up by private industry are very rare. But if the university really objects to my presence, they could drop me and have somebody else pick up the subject. This is also what it takes to run a subject for 16 people. It doesn't include the pastoral care, really. Uh, last year, for example, I had a... Um, so this was a subject that I was tutoring. I had a subject come to me to say, hey, both my parents have been arrested in a domestic violence incident. I'm going to be late on the next assignment. So I was, you know, giving that person some support while they were dealing with this and taking care of their younger siblings. I can only put in this amount of extra time because I'm not drowning in 500 students. I am, you know, well supported in other areas of my life. And while I am theoretically working about two full-time jobs in the actual hours that I'm doing, realistically, I, I am not, you know, desperately overworked in everything that I'm doing. I have another subject that I teach into that is far more straightforward, so I can basically just walk in and teach a class with a couple of hours of preparation. I'm not doing all of this preparatory work. For comparison, uh, Yo has described some of what they have experienced. I have other friends who are on things like short-term contracts rather than casual, who are coordinating three subjects. Next semester they'll coordinate four. They are dealing with 500 to 1,000 students. And, like, it gets bigger. I am doing a very small subject. I know subjects at bigger institutions which have thousands of students in them. And you're definitely not getting paid for everything you do for that. As mentioned, this is the main reason you wind up with crap subjects. They're foisted on people who don't have the time or resources to teach them properly, whether those are casual or full-time academics, to be perfectly realistic. There are some people who just don't care. Uh, I think... Among teaching academics, that's usually a result of being burned out. You do the best that you can for a long time, uh, and then it just comes a point where you can't commit the time, energy, and emotional work to providing something that is a good subject to learn. I think it depends and if people understand themselves as teachers, though, because yeah. like, if you look at, you know, like the kind of the you know, the generation of, or generations of, uh, like, permanently employed academics who are kind of now heading towards retirement or um, should have already retired, um, but don't want to because <laughs> it's, you know, pretty easy it's for them to job. Not, yeah. And they still get paid really well. Um, but, like, a lot of them don't understand themselves or didn't understand themselves as teachers. They understood themselves as people with a particular set of, you know, like a, a scholar with particular expertise. Mm. Lecturing is standing up and delivering their special knowledge to people who will receive it. Like a, you know, like <laughs> yes. an empty vessel it is being poured into to improve them. They're not mm. teaching. And also they're quite happy to deliver the same lecture for 15 years. So like, um, I yeah. know this, this sounds like it's kind of, um, I don't know. I feel like I this doesn't seem very compatible with my like pro pro like union politics around like <laughs> people's work conditions. But it's like we are talking about people like to be clear, earning immense amounts of money. Like you know, like um, maybe not by corporate sector. So uh, for but... comparison, your your typical like professorial position is about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year pre tax in Australia. A lot of money. Like yeah. that's a lot of money by, you know, any reasonable person's like life experience. Yeah. So right? that's prof sorry, I'll be clear. That's professorial. Uh, underneath that in Australia you have your um associate professors, senior lecturers and lecturers. So this is your typical structure within academics. If you're the head of school, you have more money on top of that. If you're the dean of a uh, faculty, more money and then you get your executive. Uh, the higher executive, I should say, but your lecturers are like 90 to 110, that sort of level. It's just still, you know, that's a good salary. It's not so good when you look, take into account the fact that I don't think I have found a full-time academic who works fewer than 70 hours a week. Uh, this does vary. The old guard tend to be less, uh, less uh, glued to their jobs 
depending on who they are. Old guy teaching academics doing the 80, 70 hour weeks, definitely. I do think that um, it's very, very hard to get some of these older lecturers. And particularly, I see this attitude carry on to research intensive people to recognize the value of teaching. So with COVID, with all of these casuals losing their position and the increased teaching load, you had a lot of situations where um, full-time researchers turned around and said, oh, they, they need teaching people. I can do some of that. Either they have never taught or they haven't taught in a very long time. And they, be in some circumstances, they become more of a burden than a help to the teaching staff because they don't know how to teach properly. And then you wind up managing them as well. So then the and of course managing their egos alongside that. And a lot of I don't say a lot. I see the attitude of I am here to present my knowledge to you, the empty vessel, very much more amongst the research people who step into teaching space these days. I think a lot of teaching academics, particularly teaching intensive academics, have learned otherwise because they kind of have to in order to actually teach at some point. For me in particular, like these teaching conditions, and also why I want to talk about this on the podcast, these really matter for statistics. Stats and maths are hard to teach well, particularly to people who don't have much maths background. So we do a lot of, like mathematicians in general, do a lot of service teaching into other subject areas. I am te I teach into public health. I teach into social science uh, to do quantitative methods, basically, to varying degrees of, of difficulty and understanding of the statistics. This I also see this as like a broader social issue for statistics in particular. Uni is about the only place that people get rigorous stats training. So it's bad for the general stats education of the population. And there are knock-on effects when stats teaching is impoverished in this sort of a fashion. Stats literacy in the general population is pretty shocking. And that in part comes from the fact that stats education at universities that carries on to stats education in high school is absent uh, or very poorly done. I also want to point out, as I have, that while the situation here in Australia is bad, it's still much better than other places. Um, the situation in the US is particularly dire because not only do you have the huge numbers of grad students who are basically recruited to be grad students in order to take on those teaching loads, other sessional academics are paid even worse over there than they are here. Like, they look at envy at the $20 an hour <laughs> sort of situation you would have been in. You know. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like definitely worse in New Zealand, um, for yeah. example. But I mean, all, all wages and salaries are worse in New Zealand. So Yeah, for mm. sure. Like so many, so many people, pe even people with PhDs wind up below the poverty line doing this sort of work. This, this is something that the left could get a lot more traction on than I think they are, particularly among those on the left who kind of dismiss academics as these kind of like upper middle class people off doing their own thing. There's a missed opportunity there. The unions, unfortunately, are part of this. I think that is enough of that kind of doom and gloom. Let's have a look at the mailbag for this week, which is its own kind of doom and gloom. So, yo, you come from New Zealand. I was born in New Zealand as well, so we get a little treat from New Zealand here. So this is a plot that has been sent to me by a few people, um, varying degrees of disbelief, particularly because um, this headline here, which for the um, audio-only people says, incomes have, risen, have grown faster than costs since 2017, this is New Zealand data. I think this comes from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Uh, various numbers here that are basically official statistics. You should read this in line with our earlier episode on CPI and inflation. This has been sent to me primarily for two reasons. First of all, this axis, this y axis is a bit confusing. So it starts at one, looks like 1.00 and goes up to uh, 1.5, which it turns out to be in dollars up the top there. You could have put dollars in all of these, mate. Thank you. So what you should read this as is basically a measure of inflation. It's benchmarked to 2017. And how you read this is that these lines chart the comparative cost of things over time. So what was $1 in 2017 might be $1.10 in 2022 which is what the latest data is on this plot. 
The re- other reason that it was sent to me is that, so the plot here has transport, wages, CPI, food, and housing. And housing has skyrocketed in New Zealand. So what was a dollar in 2017 is now slightly over $1.50 in 2022. I think, yeah, that'll be 2022 there. Yeah. That is, you know, that's a 50% increase in your costs. So that is a huge level of inflation, which if you look at the actual line for CPI uh, here, which looks like it goes from a dollar in 2017 to slightly over dollar ten, that could be, let's say, 1.12. So that looks like about 12% inflation since 2017 in CPI overall, but you've got about 50% inflation in housing costs. So it looks like this incomes have grown faster than costs headline is just kind of bullshit because you have this exploding housing costs while everything else is kind of pottering around uh, that sort of 12% inflation and wages have inflated more. So it looks like the wages have come up to about dollar maybe 17 yeah, it's called a dollar seventeen. So you've seventeen seen seventeen percent growth in wages. CPI has seen twelve percent uh, change over that time. I don't think this is as misleading as it first appears, precisely because the CPI, which is your consumer price index measure of change over time, does take into a, into account housing costs. See our episode on CPI for that. So I don't think it is entirely false to say that wages have grown faster than the consumer price index in this time. However, whether wages are actually a good representation of what your average person on the street gets in terms of their salary, not always the case. As we discussed in our episode on CPI and inflation, your wages amounts includes people who are CEOs and all this sort of thing. All of your salaried executives who's... uh, Salaries have pro- and bonuses have probably increased maybe 30-40% over that time. That's included in the wages. Meanwhile, your person whose minimum wage has not increased at all over the past five years or has increased like maybe 10 cents on the dollar over that time represents far less of that growth in wages than it actually looks like. So for them the amount that they have to spend, their actual CPI, if you will, their actual costs, have probably increased faster than their wages, even if at the official statistics level, it doesn't look like that. Well, yeah, and remembering that New Zealand doesn't have like an award system or anything like that either. Oh, um, really? Like, so no. it doesn't have a minimum wage? It has, minim- has minimum wage, but it doesn't okay. have like industry specific awards. Right, okay, so um, in case people are a bit confused about the terminology, the award system in Australia is a system of minimum wages. It is deliberately caused awards so people don't think they're on the minimum wage, but it changes across different industries. So um, what somebody is earning as a minimum wage in, like, I don't know, forestry or academia is not necessarily the same as what they would be earning working in a cafe or something like that, or in farming. See uh, our episode on CPI for more and that sort of thing. So New Zealand has a just a global minimum wage? It does, which Google tells me is currently it's either $20 an hour or it's about to increase to or has just increased to $21.20. Okay. An hour. So do, I, do you have casual loading on top of that as well? I realize you may or may not know this stuff given it's been a while since you were in New yeah, Zealand. Yeah, I mean, it's been I haven't lived in New Zealand since 2016. Um, yeah. And to have a bad memory, but um, <laughs> there's kind no, not. Oh, I feel like I'm going to say something that's going to turn out to be wrong. But there's like, yeah, there's like holiday pay loading and stuff. Although okay. often that's often that's kind of then re- like they'll just decide what they want to pay you, and then they'll just say that it includes that and do the calculation yeah, right. backwards. Um, Great. I feel like that happens here too. But <laughs> yes. Anyway, yeah. But yeah, so they don't have the kind of splitting up of the minimum wage that happens over here. What I, I can definitely say is that when I was uh, 19, I worked in shearing sheds mm. and a lot of New Zealand workers would come over here because compared to wages in New Zealand for that role, it was like incredible wages and conditions yeah. actually. Um, That's pretty depressing. Neoliberal hell everywhere, I suppose. Absolutely. So if you are reading this particular graph, um, certainly housing has exploded in New Zealand as a cost, 
But in terms of like the actual conditions on the ground, I don't think it's necessarily untrue, this headline. It's just the official statistics as written probably don't represent the experience of your average person and they certainly don't represent the experience of the poorest people. Well, all the like massive housing crisis and like yeah, for sure, and, like, li- like families living in cars and like the only support people getting being from like EB based like support running out of Marais and stuff. So yeah, it's real yeah. bad. <laughs> it's it's pretty fucking shit. New Zealand sucks. That's my mm. that's my only comment. It's really depressing because it's such it's such a beautiful place. I just wish it was better on the ground. You know, living conditions. All right, that is our episode. Yo, thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad I ended it on such a cheery note. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to advertise? I should have thought about this, but n- no. <laughs> no, there, no, there is not anything I would like to advertise. No worries. Uh, Bart, thank you again for joining thank me. Thank you. Um, by the way, I might just start plugging my Twitter account. Um, yeah. So it's at Snitch and Orwell. There's no G in snitching. All right, and I'll see you next time. See you then.